Okay, so today I am finally wrapping up the things I watched mostly in the fall uh, but also I kind of decided to go through all the things I watched up until the end of December because I was in Italy and actually had a lot of time to just watch Netflix at night time before going to bed so I did kind of watch a couple of things in the last couple of weeks of uh, December which technically is already winter but I thought with what I watched up to 2022 made more sense basically so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put them in order of uh, enjoyment in a sense but I'm gonna divide them by category so, um, so I'm gonna do like TV show and then from least liked to the most liked and so forth so I'm gonna start with the one that I actually watched the list of which is anime so I just watched anime and actually I'm gonna include here um, anything that is animated so I'm gonna have like a it's a TV show, but it's animated, so I'm gonna also include it in there. Apologies, don't hate me for that. So the only two things I've watched are a second place, I would probably put Rick and Morty, the new season that came out on Netflix. And I think it was just five episodes, if I'm not mistaken, or six episodes that I watched. I need to check if there are some more. But again, Rick and Morty is one of my ultimate favorite uh, I don't know, how, what is it? It's like an animated series, you call it, I guess. I love especially like the graphic novel and the animated TV show. I love both equally. I just decided to put this at number two because I the number one was more of a novelty in a sense. But with Rick and Morty, although I love the genius and I love it, and it's honestly a five stars if I have to compare this with books where we, we rate them from one being shit to five being perfect. I would still give this like a 4.5 stars, five, but I kind of seen it with time. It's kind of a formula that has, I don't know, some of the episodes in this particular season I found brilliant as always but not as entertaining as others in other seasons it kind of was pushed to second place from the first place which is demon slayer so i'm also including all of the seasons that i watched all of it so i might have started a few more i have started a few more but i've not completed them at least so that's why they're not in this list so i completed season one of uh, demon slayer on netflix and i absolutely loved it i thought I was sick at the time and so I just binge watched these. I had tried the manga before but I don't want to spend all that money on the manga that when the anime is so it's so well praised. This is the story of this little boy who loses his family to a demon attack. They're all killed apart from his sister who is transformed into a demon and the way it, they are kind of vampires and they can come out only at night. So the sister is now transformed into a demon but has not technically consumed any human yet and so he manages to save her and he goes on this journey of turning his sister back before she can actually consume any human and turn completely evil and I really loved their siblings relationship I really loved the animations of course the um, art style I loved all of that but I really really liked our two main protagonists and the kind of attachment that they have the kind of love really comes out of the screen and so that's why I love it so much and I will continue on next I'm gonna tackle the movies because actually I binge watched like a series of movies so technically speaking I've watched many movies but on paper there are less so I watched a total of four things but actually one thing would be five so it's five movies in a row basically of the same saga so a number uh, four of all I've put the Blues Brothers now I really enjoy the Blues Brothers overall it's a movie that I've never watched before it's a classic cult classic so I wanted to just watch it and I found that absolutely hilarious it's the story of these two brothers one has just escaped prison and they go back to where they were raised in this orphanotrophy run by nuns and from what I remember basically this place is about to be shut down due to foundings they decide that they need to collect money in order to keep this place going and so they need to arrange this concert and they get up to no good a lot of messes to arrange this concert and actually play and I really love how they basically destroy a lot of stuff and then they just and then they just go through a thing like they might have destroyed the palace but then they just knock the door and just go in and don't care a movie that i might even rewatch in the future was a very good time it's not my favorite cult classic either but i'm so glad they actually watch it at number three i would put motherick actually uh, i was in italy and my mom had it on sky tv so i just decided one afternoon to just watch motherick Top Gun is a movie that my mom made me watch multiple times growing up. It's like flesh dance, basically. I can recite basically parts of those movies by heart for how many times my mom made me watch. However, when, you know, Maverick came out, 
I didn't feel like it needed a sequel. And I was just like, oh, this is just a money grabber. And to be fair, I, it's a movie that I would probably not rewatch, if it makes sense. I enjoyed it though, for what it was. I think for being like a sequel of a movie that's so old and such, again, a cult classic, if you want, it's it was dangerous. And instead, I think it really nailed it. It was very Top Gun. If you've watched the first one and you watch the second, there is a continuation there. There is the same vibes going on there. And this is what I really appreciated. So I think, again, it's worth a watch, definitely. It's not my favorite movie of the year. I think a lot of people put like, oh, movie of the year? I don't agree. I don't think it was so good to deserve, to deserve movie of the year title, but I really enjoyed it for my time, for like two hours that I watched it. Number two, I've got Avatar The Way of Water. So again, I was in Italy in December, I decided to go to the cinema and watch this 3D and it was, it was epic in a sense. It's Avatar, we know it's epic and it's an epic saga and again, I'm not even attempting a synopsis because it's Avatar, guys. Like, we, we know what Avatar is. Like with Maverick, you know what Maverick is, right? Top Gun, you know. And so, The Way of Water, I found this epic and I found this as epic as the first one. I must say I really struggle with animal cruelty in movies and there is a big part of the plot here where um, animals, yes it's a fake animal, I don't care, but an animal gets hurt and for me seeing that happening I was just like with my like jumper on covering my eyes. I really really despise when animals cruelty is used to bend forward the plot in a sense. So that made me mad with the movie. I understand, but I was just so pissed off. I'd say that it's good that I was so attached at the same time to the movie that that really put me out of, you know, the atmosphere I'd gone in. I had loved uh, the kind of more quiet introduction, like the first hour and a half, which is very quiet, because then you got like two hours of action, so like an hour and a half of action. So the first hour is very quiet and calm and I really enjoyed and thrived. My emotions were very positive. I was so fascinated by the world and this new actually world that you discover in this you know, planet that they live in. And then there was a lot of action, which I loved. Unfortunately, the starting point is, you know, the animal cruelty that then led to the action that r really hit me in the chest. And I understand that, you know, this is a very personal thing. I really loved it. I don't know if, all, if I could go through the same thing of maybe now because I know what it looks like, I'll be okay. I don't know. I just, there was something about that scene that really made me think that maybe I can watch this once and I'm good with it. And at number one, it's my, Rewatch, binge watch of the five movies in the Pirates of the Caribbean saga. Now I uh, I love Pirates of the Caribbean saga, and I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm gonna watch it, not even now that Johnny Depp has left the uh, franchise, but it's not gonna be the same. Like Captain Jack Sparrow is historic. It's like I don't know. I think they made the history of cinema in a sense with, you know, especially when it comes down to pirate stories with these. I love probably the number two movie and the number three more than anything else. I think the number four and five are okay-ish, not as good as the first three. The first trilogy, chef kiss. Like this is in first place because of the first three movies not because of the fourth and fifth movie, but because I binge watched them, I wanted to in integrate them here. And this provides, first of all, a very new plot, like this kind of pirates, legends, it's something that I'd ne never seen before done. It also provides perfect, unique, quirky characters, and at the same time, the good amount of romance and plot that you want in your movie. And I was, it just has everything with the first trilogy. It was just perfect. I just wish that, unfortunately, the fourth and fifth, the fifth is better than the fourth. The fourth, no. Let's, let's pretend it's not there. But the fifth one is okay, but I just wish that, I don't know, maybe they should have just sticked with the first three. That's just my opinion. Next category is stand-up comedies. I do like to watch them uh, now and then. I think they're very refreshing, um, especially if I'm having lunch or doing something. I like to listen in the background or having a good laugh. I watched a couple while I was traveling with the train to Italy. I watched a couple when I was sick. So it was like a, just a refreshing good time. So number five, though, I would probably put, like, I always watch it and I will never do it again because I hated it in 2021 and I didn't like it in 2022. It's the best of comedy 2022 do the Netflix does. It's kind of like an anthology of just sections, short sections from different stand-up comedians put together. And I always, sometimes I even seen their 
actual full stand-up comedy and I would have not picked that moment as the most funny. It's not funny at all. Like, it's shit. Like, I don't bother. I hate that most anthologies. Like, they never make me laugh. Maybe one. I choose clips that don't often, in my opinion, reflect the amount of talent that that comedian might have. Then, one disappointment this time was Trevor Noah, new one. I wish I could. I love Trevor Noah and I used to love him when he started doing stand-up comedies, I used to like binge watch them, re-watch them, suggest people to watch them and so then I think he left for a bit and now he came back with this one and I don't think this is up to the same standards that his old stand-up comedies had. It's still good, it's still Trevor Noah, he's a very clever man that is amazing at doing accents and overall it's a very clever comedy. He always tackles very important issues and topics so that I appreciate and I will always watch his stand-up comedies. But if I have to look back and look at all his stand-up comedies, this one was one of the weakest in my opinion. Then I watched Billy Blur um, live at Red Rock. He's very mean. <laughs> I think he's a very direct and somehow um, sometimes offensive comedic style that I do like. I like how he doesn't sugarcoat things, I like how savage he can be. Now of course you don't have to agree with him on all points, but I do like how um, raw his comedy is. I've not watched all of his stuff, I need to watch his stuff in like smaller doses in a sense, but I do think he's got talent for what he does and I do appreciate how, again, the honesty that comes through uh, despite that you might agree or not agree with him. You know when you got that part of you that it's a bit more mean, like he has an opinion that might be like him, but you, you, you know, you're not that harsh when you express your opinion, you try to sugarcoat it a bit more, to be a bit more uh, kind when expressing your opinion and then there is a part of your brain that goes, well, but this is what you think. And I think he represents very well that kind of way of saying certain things that you might think in your mind mind uh, very directly and you just kind of just say it out loud so I appreciated him for that. And number two is um, Ronnie Chang, um, Asians, Comedian, Destroy um, America. I've started to watch his stuff because I found it like you know when you scroll on YouTube they, they give you the shorts so I found a couple of these shorts there and I really liked it really made me laugh so then I went and checked out his old, his old show on Netflix and I loved it I think it was I thought it was very funny I thought it was again the kind of I think it's a bit of a blend and I like his comedy especially because he's brutal and honest like Billy Blur is but sometimes the way he does his comedy just comes out slightly less aggressive in a sense and so I really like his style of clever comedy, honest comedy and I just generally had some very honest good laughs about everyday life that things that you know you don't stop and think actually how hilarious they are and so he he made a point for example he said you know how the internet made all of us more stupid and it was just like that's actually true it's incredible how having all the knowledge in the world actually made us behave more stupidly sometimes and I thought that was so clever to say so I, I really love this comedy and this content especially in this one because I've I've just watched I'm watching now another one by him but this is the first and only one that I watched completely fully and number one is The Cynic uh, by Ramesh. I'm not gonna butcher his surname, uh, but it's here. And I think he's a brilliant comedian. He's from uh, England as well, so a lot of the things he says, although, you know, I didn't grow up here, but now I've been here for a bunch of years. So I kind of resonates, it resonates with the culture I am currently living in. So that's why maybe I love him particularly. But yeah, absolutely cherish his comedy is it's always it always makes me f laugh a lot i found this particularly funny i think this is probably the cynic is probably my favorite thus far of him it was hilarious and i really had very good laughs true crime documentaries so at uh, number four i've watched four of them and at number four i've got um i am a killer season three i thought this season was pretty bland i think other season especially first season was stronger than this and this is a true crime series where they interview people in america that have been convicted of murder. Now in season one I think there was a focus on people that had gone to death row. Now this is not the case anymore. From season two you kind of have people that have never been put to death because of their crimes but they're just committed homicide and I think this season just I honestly can't remember one case of that. It didn't really stick with me much but overall I think it's a very good format but because in an hour you're trying to convey you know the story of the killer as well as the victim it doesn't leave you much room or space to really delve deep into things so it's kind of superficial in a sense but it's a good anthology and number three i would have a, a texan killing fields and a visit was very fascinating it's basically the story of this bunch of girls that have been found in this field in texas 
for other years and they believe that there is a serial killer being active. This is number three, not because of quality, I really really enjoyed this one. Ultimately though we don't have a firm answer, we don't really exactly know what happened and so despite the fact that there is a good a solid theory if you want we don't have final answers so there is always a bit of frustration that comes when you watch a true crime and you don't have an outcome. Uh, but it's yeah, proven, basically. So for example, number two, I have a raincoat killer. And here is this kind of Korean serial killer of whom I knew nothing about. And it's a very unique one because he would initially started, when he started his career as a serial killer, he would break in people's homes and kill everybody, which is so scary and then he moved on and actually he would hire or you know pay for a prostitute and then he would kill her a sex worker mostly and finally you know you do have closure in these because they do find the guy what it's lacking from these was the motivation of a killer. I think because the culture is also different, where um, forensic psychology, I don't know how much advanced it is at that point in time, they tell you basically how they caught the killer, the evidence and what happened when they caught him. They have a bit of a situation like a Ted Bundy situation for a while, not that, that tragic but very close to and so that was scary even to watch. Anyway, they resolve it so he ends up you know with the killer getting captured and and so he, he resolves itself the situation however there is very little introspection on the motives that led this man in committing this string of horrible murders but if you like true crime and serial killers you want to check out the raincoat killer because this is a is a very prolific serial killer as well that it's not well known at all in the wider world and I understand that you know uh, serial killers are mostly famous from what I know of from you know USA especially and then probably Britain and Australia but I think if you are very passionate about finding out more about them we should be more aware of you know in other serial killers from other parts of the world and so I was very grateful that I could find this on Netflix and on number one there is Unsolved Mysteries the first three season I binge watched this and couldn't get enough and yes I just said that there is an element of frustration that comes with not having the answers to the who done it when you watch a true crime series however I found these mysteries some of them were clearly not mysteries. Some of them were mysteries in the sense that we know who done it, they don't know where he or she was. And that was frustrating because you know what happened, but unfortunately, you know, the culprit is not behind bars. But many others, there is no answer. And I was just so fascinated by you know that kind of sparked my intrigue of oh I'm gonna solve this case of course I'm not but it kind of made me think about possible theories and so on so I really really hope that eventually they solve some of these crimes and then we'll do like a follow-up series where they solve it I would love to see that but I think these really called to the Sherlock Holmes inside myself and I went to look online for solutions I was so intrigued by these cases and that's why I just kept watching. I just watched three seasons and there are like 10 episodes in each season in like a week, like I couldn't stop watching so it was very addictive and that's why I put in number one. Also I didn't clarify, this is an anthology collection of murders, mysteries, people disappearing in very weird circumstances. Each episode it's a new mystery and that's why I found it particularly fascinating. Sorry I forgot I actually watched five things. And at number five I would put The Worst Roommate. This is an anthology, I think just four or five episodes where basically people were killed by someone they used to live with and I found this mostly, I don't know, I didn't really love it. I found the cases interesting but also very frustrating that people could get away with this you know this shit basically. Ultimately I don't know something didn't click with me. I don't have like I didn't hate it or anything I would probably watch a sequel series but I didn't just I didn't love it as a format or the way it was directed done. I found it like it was compared to other stuff I watched basically it wasn't as good as other stuff. Series TV. Eight of them completed at least a season. Um, I would number eight I would put Wednesday. Now I didn't hate Wednesday, Wednesday is kind of like a new Netflix show about Wednesday Adams where she goes to this dark academia and she just she's up to no good and there is like a murder mystery that she has to solve. The internet blow up with this one and the only thing I wanted to watch was her dancing to Lady Gaga song and actually when I went to the scene the soundtrack was different, like it wasn't there. Uh, I I thought this was very meh. I do love the Adams family, I'm not obsessed with it. I thought it was very well directed, I liked her as an actress, but it was very 
it's for teens and I think I kind of grow a bit out of this so I don't know if I will ever watch the second season am I am I not I thought that also the mystery was pretty clear I love Xavier though so him his character I really liked so just I might just watch them to see what happens to you know um Xavier and so on but just felt a bit old and I could see things coming basically the same probably must be applied to lock and key season two now season two was very it's better than season one in my opinion and this is a trilogy so it's three four seasons three seasons i believe and it's based on lock and key from, from joe hill which is a graphic novel series i absolutely adored these unfortunately worked way better for me in graphic novel format rather than actually watching the tv show i enjoyed it i love the atmosphere i create i like the acting and the characters but there is just something that doesn't pull me back once i switch off the tv if i have to choose what to watch next i often don't reach out for it so for example i started season three and kind of left it there and then i thought about different things i wanted to watch instead and so i never continued on i probably eventually will but although i enjoy the episode i just don't feel compelled to go back it's for teens and again same thing with adams i think i'm just getting a bit too old to watch certain stuff or to really get into certain stuff or maybe it's the way they're directed and done because i did love other teen series number six we got the senior uh, season three and four now season three would be probably before wednesday technically but season four i really really loved and it probably was my favorite series i think the senior is a detective series where in each season you follow different crime but it's the same detective trying to find what happened what i really liked about the sinner is the format because in the first seasons for example you know who the culprit is you just have to reconstruct their story and why they ended up doing what they did now season one i thought the reasons behind was a bit bullshit uh, season two very strong season three you actually follow him having to deal with a psychopath and it was weird and it was well done but i didn't love it i just something didn't click with me while season four i loved way more it's apparently the suicide that is it a suicide is it not and you find out the story and it takes place in this small island with you know there is a small cast of characters so the intrigue behind and why things developed the way they did uh, in my opinion was very well done however if you are into a thriller crime series you might want to check this out because it's definitely for a unique format at number five we have only murders in the building and it's about this young girl played by um, selena gomez and these two old guys that solve mysteries solve murders that happen in the building in new york where they live and it's absolutely hilarious like i had some very genuine good laughs i think if you like comedies and if you like like a bit of a spin murdery twist to it this is a perfect match i will always watch murders in the building and especially the two older guys like the two actors that play the older guys and i loved them in other movies so i really i was really familiar with them and i found them so so hilariously so naturally funny and it's just yeah the mystery the mystery sometimes has some good twists some i could call and it's also like 20 minutes episode 25 minutes episode so it's so digestible so entertaining for what it is that i absolutely loved it number four we have the umbrella academy season three now this is the second to last season and i the umbrella academy the first two seasons are definitely my favorite among my favorite tv shows ever of the last few years and now season three wasn't as good as the other two seasons in my opinion something was missing and the character of Alison I despised like I would I was never her biggest fan but in this one although I couldn't send her of pain as a mother of going through what she did and I got that I still couldn't justify how she could be fucking horrible with all the people in her life that actually the only people that were there for her something was not there and i think because this is takes place in a very enclosed setting where they are all basically in this hotel all the time i thought yet less room for the characters to grow more like i saw the characters kind of go kind of taking a back seat rather than developing more and although i really enjoyed it i really i love klaus klaus is my favorite <laughs> of, of all i just saw it was a bit limited 
a scope. It was, it was fascinating though, the, the background, um, like what happens, like the mystery behind, very fascinating. Uh, the bad guy and all of that, very good. It was ultimately very good, but not as good as the other ones. And number three, we got the Ring of Powers. And yes, I know, people hated this and I didn't. I absolutely love it. This was directed and shot. The places, I found it was just beautiful. In terms of the plot, because you know already where this is going, I probably don't have the same high expectations that maybe other people held. I don't know, I just thought, we, we know this is gonna become, you know, eventually it's gonna, whatever is gonna happen is then gonna lead to the events of Lord of the Rings. And that's why I don't love usually prequel series because I think it's very hard, kind of, you know, make me be on the edge of my seat and looking forward to what's gonna happen because ultimately it doesn't matter how you do it, that's gonna be the end, right? You know, the end is gonna be always the same because that's when the other story, the story that I'm familiar with starts. So I didn't have the same high expectations that maybe other people had. Actually, I was pleasantly surprised by the twist. I kind of call it right in the, you know, the episode that was happening, but up until that point I was fooled, so that was good. And I just, I enjoyed it. I think it's a very good uh, also cast of characters and I think the way they move from character to ca character is done well. It's not the best thing I've ever seen, but it's beautiful to watch and I will definitely, definitely continue on. Number two, number two is Guillermo del Toro Cabinet of Curiosities. This came out around uh, October. It's a horror anthology where each episode is a short story, horror short stories. And it's actually each story is based on a novella, I believe, or a story. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was. And Guillermo del Toro is the um, producer of this. He actually produced this, but each episode had different directors. And you could really tell because each episode was unique. Some stories clicked with me more than others, but the characters often are very famous actors. And I really love when they do anthologies with them with famous actors because, you know, there was Ron for Harry Potter. And it's like, oh, that's Ron. And it was a complete horrific scenario was thrown in. Really loved that. I put the order of my episode here or which one I love the most and which one I like the least. But overall, it's a format that I started appreciating with um, Love, Death and Robots, and I will now always reach out for it, especially if it's fantasy or horror. I wouldn't probably check another anthology. I wouldn't check like a romance anthology, just because I don't care about the genre. So I think the premise is you have to really like the genre before appreciating such an anthology. But if you do, this is unique. It was horror-ish, but yeah, I don't do horror. I don't do like horrific horror, like very sinister movies. I don't like them, I, they scare me. So the fact that I could put up with these and like this enough, it means that it was horrorish. A lot of horror fantasy though. So it was very doable, a lot of monsters and stuff happening that was creepy, but definitely doable. And hands down, number one, I am converted. I didn't want to continue on with this series. And then people in my life were like, Eva, you have to watch it you have to watch it and I did. So at number one we have season three and four of Stranger Things. Now I know I'm behind this. Season four came up ages ago. Actually I did watch, sorry, season two as well. So season two, three and four. But season three and four stuck with me the most. I, listen, the character of Steve and Dustin, I just, I don't have to say anything else, right? Like Steve and Dustin, Steve and Dustin, I want to tattoo their name on my body. Like I loved them. I, I love them. Initially, I didn't click much with Eleven and I thought the first, I don't know, the first season was okay, I enjoyed it, but I never felt like I wanted to continue on. And then I watched the first episode of season two and kind of gave up, but then people told me, you need to keep going, you need to keep going, and I, you have to. Listen, I don't love sci-fi and I think that's why I struggle initially with this, um, but this is more fantasy than sci-fi in a sense. I don't mind it. I love the castle characters, but I also ultimately love how epic this is and the soundtrack i you know it helps that 80s music is my favorite kind of music ever like i listen to all kind of music but if i have to pick up a music that i will never get bored of is 80s music so so when you know running up that hill by kate bush came up as you know a major soundtrack a major actually part of a plot in season four i was screaming at that point and i think also like the way these seasons keep improving and getting more epic more just visually stronger i was in oh even for example at the beginning of season four there is um a part of a plot that takes place in a prison basically and i didn't really like that but the way they twisted it around the way they made that 
ultimately finished it was epic i was like okay i'm gonna you know i'm gonna shut up from now on if i don't like part of the plot i'm just gonna stick around until the end because i know you're gonna make these come out well i know you will and i am a huge fan now but thank you guys for watching let me know what was your favorite watch of 2022 i'd love if you want to divide them in category what was your favorite anime what was your favorite tv show or movie or any other category that you might have watched if you're new i would love for you to subscribe yes i this channel is mostly books and comics graphic novel and manga that i read but i also do sometimes make content about what i watch especially seasonally i'll see you next time Take care of yourself and thank you again for watching. Ciao!